try to develop 3D fluorescent imaging technique in order to visualize the biological process um, better with higher spatial resolution and also be able to image longer and faster to capture the details of how biology happened at protein level or cellular level or multicellular level. That information is a fortune. I think it can lead us to a complete understanding in, in, in bioscience and in, in relate to the, our, our health and for clinical applications, disease diagnostic, etc. because it's tissue, right? And then that means you can correlate, you can connect this to billion dollar, even trillion dollar business. And that is the impact I think all the future I'm looking for. That's why we are giving our uh, entire um, design, software, everything to research labs for non-commercial use. We are happy, very happy actually, we are honored to uh, to do that, to, to re return our knowledge to the society, not only to, to China, I mean to, to everyone uh, in the world. No, someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakyan. We're on site at the beautiful Westlake University in Hangzhou, China. We are now going to be talking about tiling light sheet microscopy. We have Dr. Liang Gao joining us. Hi today. everyone. Hi Liang, thank you so Hi. much for joining thank us Thank you for show. having me. Yes. Really appreciate you coming on. Thanks. Thank you very much. For those who don't know Liang's background, he's an associate professor at Westlake University pioneering new optical methods enabling rapid high resolution 3D imaging of expanded biological specimens. And you can find the links in the bio below. Liang, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions we like asking our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Well, that's a big question. I think definitely, uh, we are trying to understand our life. We are trying to um, understand each other better and we are trying to build a better world for everybody, uh, for ourselves. I think that's a goal and the direction of the world. Uh, of course, there, there are a lot of back and forth possibly, but in the end, I think we are going to reach there. Basically, we are going to reach place that is that work better for everyone and for um, everybody hopefully can get their right destiny yes <laughs> and what do you think is an important skill for us to embody to ensure that we continuously improve our civilization i think one of the most important thing is perhaps uh, again let's say um so basically of course in order to achieve something you have to basically be regulated and be regulated means two regulated on, uh, on two parts of our life one is regulation on others the second is regulation ourselves mm -hmm. so basically we perhaps cannot put a lot of hope in how to regulate other people's behavior mm -hmm. but what we can put our efforts in or what we can do better certainly is we can regulate ourselves better and if we truly understand the meaning of life, understand what we are, where we are uh, marching on, and what's the goal um, of our life, I think we can regulate ourselves better. And if meanwhile, if we have better understanding, better communication, make sure that everybody understands each other, and in the end, I think we can reach that goal by better regulation of ourselves. Yes. Perhaps, yeah, if we think about what's the most important part, perhaps that's a very important thing, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely in the top. Some of the oldest advice, know thyself, and also do a really good job at regulating your emotions, your goals, your aspirations, your uh, family relationships, your career, the community around you. This is very, very important, critical. I like that a lot. Yeah, focus. Regulation of the cell. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I love that. <laughs> let's talk about you as a child. So let's talk about your journey. Where were you born? How did you get interested in optics and science? Okay. So I was born in Shanxi province in China. 
and uh, at one year old, my parents moved to most western part of China because of their job. Uh, the province called the Xinjiang province of China, so with a lot of minority people. And then I moved there at one, and then I grew up there until I was 17. Uh, after that, I was admitted into Tsinghua University in Beijing. And then I went there for college. I spent uh, seven years in that university. Uh, my major was called, uh, it's called uh, precision instrumentation. So I, built in, I learned how to build instruments. I got my bachelor and master degree in that university. So it's a good university at some point, let's say in, in, in most people's uh, uh, mind, it's a very good university. I do agree with it, but there are something I think I didn't learn during that period of time. I was trained in a lot of how to optimize a lot of details. I was training in electronics, mechanics, everything. But in the end, I don't know what kind of instrument I want to build. <laughs> I have very little understanding uh, on instrument uh, industry because it was not so, let's say, developed in China at that period of time, in maybe year of 2000. And then I was thinking about why I'm doing this. And then I searched uh, around. I searched what kind of uh, uh, areas need more instrument. And at that point in time, I learned uh, actually analytical instrumentation is a very, uh, let's say, uh, important uh, industrial area. And they do need all kinds of instruments to, anal to analyze the chemicals we are uh, dealing with every day. And one of the techniques is called mass spectrometry. So basically, it analyzes molecular weight. And by doing that, we can know what chemicals are there in the uh, samples. And then, well, I thought that's a great direction. And meanwhile, my wife went to the US, and she uh, went to the Purdue University. and at and uh, uh, fortunately, there was a very famous professor called Graham Cooks in the in chemistry department of Purdue University. And he was an uh, uh, expert in mass spectrometry, especially uh, instrumentation mass spectrometry, basically how to build better mass spectrometer. And my major was precise, precision instrument, so it's a perfect match. And then I think, wow, I, I can go to that department and learn what's a real instrument that people need, and I can. Uh, maybe find a better goal of my life, learn how, what I want to do in the rest of my, my life to reach a better career, right? So I also applied that university and indeed joined Dr. Graham Cook's lab and uh, doing mass spectrometry uh, during my PhD. That was from uh, 2005 to 2009 until I graduated. So indeed during that period of time, I, I uh, built, uh, let's say, uh, the first class, let's say the uh, uh, the instrument I built called miniature mass spectrometer. The reason that in direction is important is because the conventional mass spectrometer are huge, very large. I mean, all, all usually typically weights about a hundred kilogram or even more. Uh, meanwhile, there are a lot of uh, applications. You 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 want a very uh, quick measurement, fast me fast response measurement of the chemical environment. For example, in the uh, in industry side, for example, a, an, another important application is in astronomy. So we send satellite to different, for example, to Mars, right? But we do want to know what's the chemicals uh, on Mars. So the best one of the best way actually they indeed send mass spectrometers to Mars to measure the uh, chemical components on that planet. And then, of course, you need to build a very small but precise mass spectrometer in order to do that. And uh, uh, so that's a major motivation of my research during that period of time. And I indeed build very small mass spectrometers. One of them is only 5 kilograms, and it can do a lot of awesome things. And actually, I invi invi uh, invented a very important device called the Discontinuous Atmospheric Pressure Interface to introduce ions from atmosphere to vacuum space efficiently with a very small equipment. And uh, actually that device was used on, a, on the latest Mars rover uh, wow. built by, uh, I think, European, um, what's that, EPS? So basically uh, it's, uh, it's called ExoMars 2020. It's going to be launched in, uh, uh, yeah, next year. <laughs> and uh, yes, that device was actually used in the latest Mars rover going to be sent to Mars. But anyway, uh, so that was what I was doing during my PhD. I think it was uh, pretty successful. I learned many things in that lab. 
And then, of course, in 2009, I graduated from uh, Purdue, right? Let's, and let's stay on the subject for a little bit longer, and then we'll move uh, sure, on. Sure, yes. So, miniaturizing mass spectrometry. Yes. So, taking the machine size from 100 kilograms right. and bringing it down to 5 kilograms. Exactly. So, it can do things like go on satellites to Mars. Exactly. Because it's expensive to launch things into space. Exactly, uh, the yeah. Wings. And so that's one of the relatable examples. Uh -huh. And then also just this move in general. So your, your wife was first, she right. came first to Purdue. Yes, and exactly. And then you came following. Exactly. Okay, cool, cool. And then what was it like when you first arrived and you were immersing in the United States culture? What was that like? And also, what was it like when you discovered that you could miniaturize some uh, a machine that was 100 kilograms down to five how did you come up with those ideas right so let's first let, let's talk about what's my feeling when i first went to the u.s so basically i until i um when moment i went to the united states i haven't been traveling to any other country so the entire world is quite um that's a very fresh very uh mystery place to me I, I, so I was very excited um, to but basically everything happening there uh, when I arrived is, is, is very attractive, very new to me and uh, I, I think I, I uh, adapted to the environment quickly uh, because I, I, I think let's say one of the most uh, impressive uh, things I, I think everybody was so nice <laughs> uh, gentle and polite. Uh, that's perhaps one reason I, I could adapt into the environment uh, quickly. And also, and the other thing I realized is uh, I w had a lot of freedom to do what I want. Although I was paid, I was supported by Purdue University, by Dr. Graham Cooks uh, with research assistantship, so I, I need to do research in his lab. But uh, uh, actually, I was not required to do some specific thing. I, I do have the space to think about my own ideas, to find the topic that I think interesting and uh, what I need to do. So that's something I, I, I um, most impressive to me. So basically, the freedom and uh, how, how nice, how su supportive the environment uh, was when I uh, arrived in the U.S. And also, the other thing is, I, I think um, because at my period of time, even, uh, I think even by now, when we think about the, the most advanced technology, we, all th we always think about the United States, right? So at that point, be also when I was at Tsinghua, I think we did some pretty awesome projects. But one thing we are not sure is we, don't have the, we didn't have the confidence about the level of our project was. We don't know what's a what the world, world first class project, what's the best project, what's the frontier, really frontier problems people are working on, and we have no clue of that. But after I um, went to the United States and joined the Dr. Uh, Graham Cook's lab, because he was a leader in that area, I knew, wow, oh, this is uh, the, the most frontier project that people are working on, and this is a cutting edge technology. And then I, I have the confidence, oh, the, what I'm working on represents the highest level of this field. I, I think that's very important for the de development of uh, young scientists. Bas basically, establish the confidence of your own ability, your own vision, uh, your, your own judgment. I, I think that's something I, I gained I mean, uh, from the experiences uh, in Purdue. And after that, I mean, because you, you, you knew you are working on the most, let's say, uh, frontier project and you do can release your, your mind, right? You, you, you can think about whatever crazy ideas uh, to work on instead of uh, suspecting whether this is something makes sense at all, right? Because you know, you know the status of the, of, of the uh, frontier. So anything that is new into your mind, you know it is new for the entire field, right? And you can just move forward with that idea. I think that's something um, uh, very important to me and I think to anyone who was trained in the United States, yes know where the frontier is and then have the confidence and the vision to do the work at the frontier. So then you guys, how did you have the foresight to say, okay, how do we bring this down, the mass spectrometry down and 
Right. So basically, that is project not started by myself. So basically, it 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 has a history. Actually, this project has a history. Go back to maybe sixties.、Uh, There was a scientist、uh, in University of Minnesota. I'm sorry, I cannot remember his、uh, full name. He's an Italian American.、Uh, I think his、um, last name or first name is Alfredo.、Uh, so he basically he was a part of that Manhattan Project, right?、Mm -hmm. That nuclear、uh, project basically used mass spectrometry to separate、uh, uranium to, to make it uh, more um, to purify the. The chemical, and then at some point、uh, in the 1960s, 70s, the United States started that aerospace project, of course, to and then people has a need to send the、uh, mass analyzer into the space, and he started that idea, say if we can build miniature mass spectrometers, and then we can achieve certain certain goals, and indeed people. Start to build a different version of mass spectrometers and make them small and then send them to space to actually many different、uh, planets. But of course, the techniques is developing, right? So we can build better and better instrument with more analytical ability、yes. to analyze more complicated chemicals. For example, at the beginning, people will be happy to see whether there is water, whether is there、mm -hmm. oxygen or carbon dioxide. What's the concentration of them? In the atmosphere, right? But at some point, people would like to see whether there is amino acid, whether there could be protein or more complicated molecules、uh, on those planets, so we can learn more about the environment of those planets, right? And then, so by inherit the previous knowledge, and also be, on the other hand, because I was trained in instrumentation. So although I was in a chemistry department, a lot of、uh, my colleagues、uh, or many other students they were chemists, but I'm actually a mechanist or let's say let's say how to say that word. So I build instrument. I know how to make those things happen. So it's it's just so natural to me, and actually it's a.、Um, Yeah, that's why I I I I, say, I think I suddenly find a place that I can apply what I learned into the, uh, in, into some very important and interesting uh, uh project. So yeah, things happen so natural to me. I I that that's that's my feeling. Another thing I think I have to appreciate is uh, Dr. Graham Cooks has a lot of collaboration with uh industrial companies. For example. Uh, the Thermo Fisher, now called Thermo Fisher,、mm -hmm. at that point there was a mass spec company called Finnegan. Thermo、uh, Finnegan, they build,、mm -hmm. let's say, the best mass spectrometers in the world,、mm -hmm. and they have the biggest market share at this point. So they do have a lot of collaborations,、uh, and then from that collaboration, I think I also learned the organization of big companies,、uh, how they are starting a project. Uh, why? How do they make decision about whether they want to、uh, start initiate a product or not? I mean,、uh, what going to be kind of resources going you are going to need in order to make that happen? Kind of thing. So、uh, indeed, yes. So basically, so part of my、uh, training happened naturally about my research, about my instrumentation ideas, etc.、Uh, many of them are just, I think they. Emerge gradually during my education, why I learn more and more、um, stuff、um, during those years, and、uh, and also when you are in a environment that you are encouraged to think actively, because I do have the freedom, right? Because he, my my advisor was so busy, he, he barely have talk,、uh, had time to talk to me. So when you're in that environment, you 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 can think、uh, freely, and you have the resource, and indeed, I mean, it's um yeah, there there not much better environment than that to 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 really、uh, produce some good、uh, research results. Yes. Yeah. Thinking、yeah. freely, having the resources, and also those collaborative partnerships that you were talking about. Exactly. Very crucial. Let's go to the postdoc then. Sure. So this was at Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Yes. And so what were you doing there? So I was building a.、Uh, Fluorescence microscope there, and try to basically try to develop three D fluorescence imaging technique in order to visualize the biological process、um, better with higher spatial resolution, 
and also be able to image longer and faster to capture the details of how biology happened at protein level or cellular level or multicellular level. Yeah, actually this is also um, um, an interesting transition because mass spectrometry has nothing to do with fluorescent microscopy, right? Mm. Um, that's another thing, actually, an important decision in my career. Uh, so the reason is that after I graduated from Purdue, I mean, let's say I learned several things. I mean, why why you make a decision to do certain to do certain things to decide what is your career? I think you have to find something you enjoy, right? If you don't enjoy it, you you cannot do it well. You have you have to find something that you think it's important. You can convince yourself to spend a lot of time on that thing, right? And then you have to think of in what way you can make an uh, impact, right? And miniature mass spectrometry or miniature mass, spect mass spectrometer is a very cool project. But at that point, I don't see how it can influence a lot of people. Because yes, send, send something to Mars is very important, but only a very small amount of people are going to care that thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, Which is the benefits of being able to unlock it, it, the biology it, it, of our exactly. life. Exactly. Right? So, so I think I, I indeed I want to choose more important projects. So basically, everybody wants to have more positive impact on the society, on the environment, right? So I decide to change my uh, research direction. Let's say the other reason I decide to quit uh, from mass spectrometry field is because of uh, mass spectrometry is a very complicated instrument. And it's a, it's a very well established field because it's a, it has a hundreds of billion dollar market. That's why there are a lot of big companies like Angelant, like Thermal, uh, Waters, they spend a lot of resources in their own R&D. And for a academia lab, in order to compete with them to build a better instrument, it's almost a mission impossible because they have very experienced, for experienced engineers. They have uh, people work on a small trivial per, I mean, Small project are very important thing for many many years to improve the performance, right? There's no way for a research lab to compete with industry company in that level. Basically, in any well defined uh, regime of science or any or technology, I mean, academia just cannot compete with companies. That's something I, I learned because they have resources and momentum to optimize things better, right? And I learned I have to pick something that important has big impact. But um, but not that attractive to um, to those big companies, and I thought life sciences perhaps I a, a field I, I should uh, step into, and imaging is something seems so interesting because I was always amazed by those images, and then uh, yes that's the, why I made the decision to get into flies and microscopy, and then the reason is where. You want to do your postdoc, right? Because in this day, if you know, let's say if your PhD, you want to do something completely different from your PhD during a postdoc, you are having very big risks. First, nobody's going to want you because why, right? Because uh, you cannot do anything. <laughs> uh, second, second thing is you are risk yourself, your own career, right? And then also, I know actually. But of course, the important thing is you want to convince people because for myself is I, if I have interest in something, if I can, can convince myself to do something, I will spend my time, I will do my best. And after I graduated from Purdue, I think I picked up that confidence that I can, if I want to handle it well, I want to do it well, I, 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 could, I could do it. That's some, I was pretty confident at that point uh, of time. And you still had high neuroplasticity too to be able to make this. Right, right. Like and then I checked all those labs about um, uh, which lab are doing, let's say, frontier imaging. What's a frontier imaging labs? And then, so occasionally I read a report about Eric Bazic. So mm -hmm. yeah, if you have a chance, you should uh, check his uh, mm -hmm. story. Very interesting, very, um, so, so he is a, such a inspiring person that he, he has, he had actually a very difficult career in his, uh, I, I think, I think it's a difficult, successful but difficult because he changed his career many times. He used to be a scientist and then he used and then became a mechanical engineer in his father's factory, um, self-employed or jobless, let's say, and then come back to academia and become uh, win Nobel Prize. What inspired me is that 
this, of course, in 2009, he didn't uh, earn a Nobel Prize, but he published a very important paper about super resolution. The paper actually got him a uh, Nobel Prize. And then I saw how to increase the resolution with microscopy. Yeah, break the diffraction limit, and Breaking then the diffraction. Limit. Yeah, so basically, uh, re usually we can s our res uh, resolution of flies and the imaging is dominated by diffraction limit of light. Right, we can see maybe two hundred nanometers. That's the best we can see. But with his method, we can uh, drive that resolution down to about 10 nanometer resolution. That's a reason. So that's his idea. And he indeed actually uh, practiced that idea, make that, made it happen. That's why he uh, won Nobel Prize. And he did a lot of other important um, uh, researches in his uh, career as well. And explain this to us. Um, why is there a diffraction limit with light? Oh, so basically the light is actually an electrical magnetic wave, right? And then if it's a wave, then it means it has certain wavelengths. And then in order to create an image, basically we need to use that wave to create a focus, right? Basically we need to collect a lot of light and then focus them into a spot. Because that light has a certain wavelength, it won't be past the, 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 the minimum spot size you can create with that light. It cannot be less than half of the wavelength of that light. And then that is called the diffraction limit. For example, if we use green light to do image, and then uh, the wavelength of the green light is perhaps somewhere around 520 nanometer, mm -hmm. and then we divide that by two is about 260 nanometer. Mm -hmm. Of course, if we can, if we use different imaging buffer, we can push that resolution a little bit lower to maybe 200 kind of thing, but that's the best you can do without doing anything else. But with his method, you are able to uh, push the me uh, push the resolution down to 10 nanometers. And is is that going further on the electromagnetic spectrum past the uh, past the violet? Is that are we going? How how do you get down past 200 oh, so nanometers? That method was very clever. The, it's actually so basically there is a requirement. Let's say uh, 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 let's start a little bit, um, make the story a little bit longer. Yes. Basically, how we can see a stuff, let's say see a cell, see its structure, single cell. Yeah, because they don't emit light, right? So there is no way we can see them by any let's say equipment or by our bare eyes without seeing any, without doing anything to the sample. We have to shine light at it and image it. Yeah, and the then the more, more important thing is we have to add a probe, add something that can emit light onto the object that we want to study. So what people uh, did was another Nobel Prize work actually it's called GFP. It's uh, Roger Chen won that prize it's a bit, uh, and a few other scientists. So basically you label a molecular uh, probe, a protein probe genetically to the molecule you want to study. And that probe is called uh, that's GFP. So basically when you shine a laser to that molecule and that molecule is going to emit fluorescence and by collecting that fluorescence you will be able to see that molecule, right? But if you just uh, do that regular observation, you won't be able to uh, exceed the diffraction limit. Mm -hmm. Unless one thing you can do is if those labels, if they emit one by one, not emit sim at the same time. So basically, what you are, the images you are going to see is just a random spot, right? However, if you know that your molecules are emitting light one by one, and you see a uh, random spread spot, you know that the spot, the center of spot is a molecule, right? And then you can use that image to localize the position of that molecule. And then you re repeat this process to let all molecules shine, uh, emit uh, in sequence, and then you can find the location of all your flies and probes, right? And in the end, you create an image that passes past the uh, diffraction limit of light. So basically, this is Eric's idea. He I'm actually, trying to make a specific part of the cell, like a protein, fluoresce, mm -hmm. so I can image it. Right. And that is already past the diffraction that limit. is not past the diffraction limit, but the way you collect the signal and find the location of the molecule yeah. is a key. Is past the diffraction limit. I, 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 exactly. Okay, because okay. a protein in a cell is about how many nanometers? The protein of a cell is about four to five nanometer. As wow. we, that, that's a typical size of a, of a protein. There are larger yeah. ones, smaller yes, ones. Yes, okay. Yeah, about a few nanometers typically. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the first, your first like aha moments were that you can 
do a microscopy at even sub 200 nanometer levels and you wanted to go even deeper into understanding how to do that and right, build, right. build new tools yeah. to enable us to go deeper than that. Right, actually a little bit different direction though. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that was Eric's work, right? And that was uh, what inspired me to join his lab because I knew, wow, this is such a smart person and he's so cool. And I, although I knew nothing about my microscopy, because he was not that famous at that period of time, I knew I had a chance to join his lab. And I knew this is, must be a person I like because he has been following his dream uh, in his career. And I like this idea. So I think we can, per perhaps we can have some uh, um, echo each other, right? And then I write a e long email to him and he invited me to, to interview and then I joined his lab. And then I start to work on 3D flies and imaging, which is actually another dimension of imaging. Let's think about this way. If you want to understand the life, right, you need to understand two things. You need two kind of information. One is a spatial resolution, right? Basically, you have to see the details, right? You have to see the object. And the other dimension is you want to see the process, you want to see the things alive, right? Because if you, for any super resolution technique, or most super resolution technique, what you have is a very high resolution image of a dead sample, of a fixed sample, a dead stuff, yeah. at the moment, on a plane. That's the most of time you can get. I mean, how much you can interpret this life, a living process from that information, not enough, right? And then you will need, you will want to have a image a live dynamic 3D process alive with high resolution. And that's a different challenge. And that is a project I was working on when I was in Eric's lab and since that actually. So the differences I, between like something as a very thin slice of some tissue over uh, one moment in time right. versus the already dead versus something that's alive yeah, yeah. like a drosophila fruit fly right, right, and right. being able to image while it's alive over time right, with the right. brain or something. Right, you, you can yeah. think about that the way. Or you can say, you, you, let's say you are having a HD image, let's mm -hmm. say 4K image in your hands about a um, football game. Or you prefer to say, uh, to let's say to, to, to watch the game at maybe 480 <laughs> uh, yeah. pixel resolution yeah. for, for a whole one hour. play. Just yeah. one play versus the whole game. It, it, yeah. it, exactly. Yeah. So basically, actually, you want both, right? You want, yeah. the, you want the yeah. high resolution yes. live video of the entire process, yeah. but at that point of time, 2010, there were some uh, several good live imaging technique, but I like that sports analogy a lot. Right, That's a really good one actually. Sure, one seeing one play of the game and trying to make some uh, inference about how the biology works right. versus watching the whole game in high definition. Exactly. Um, that's a really good analogy. Yeah. So in the end, we are collecting information of the process, live process, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, and then that was uh, the, let's say the motivation of my project, how I started it. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the beginning, when I joined his lab, I mean, uh, Eric gave me the idea called Bessel Beam Play Information Microscopy. I mean, I, I, I had, so at that time, I, I, I have no idea whether that's a good idea, bad idea, working or not working idea. Um, but because I have trust on him, so I trust his idea. Uh, and I just, I, I think I will be successful just following his instruction and make it happen. I think I will learn things. So in the end, I worked very hard at that period of time. Uh, that's another advice perhaps to most people or young, younger generations. So when I joined his lab, Eric asked me, in his email, he asked me, he, he, he just emailed me, said, can you work 80 hours per week? <laughs> if you cannot, just don't come, right? You, you cannot have anything down. If you can, yeah, you are welcome. <laughs> yes, and I think, man, to be honest, when you work on something like 80 hours a week, I mean, I'm willing to do that, I mean, because uh, if I, am, I was not working for 80 hours per week, I, I said I'm, I'm actually wasting my time because the reason I go there is I want to learn this stuff, right? Yes. I want to learn it as quick as possible, yes. and I want to learn it from the best scientists, so I won't waste my time. So and I, push the frontier. It, it, exactly. Versus right. what would you be doing? Yeah, in the otherwise, why, how, otherwise, go home and watch TV instead? Yeah, you know, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then nothing more interesting than, yes. than work at some point, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, not a problem at all. And then I joined this, his lab and uh, worked on that project. In, indeed, that was a very fantastic project. I think 
we we were the first group showing very indeed I mean subcellular um, high resolution 3D uh, light process of cell behaviors, subcellular behaviors, etc. So that was um, in 2011. We published our first paper about basal beam play emulation microscopy on Nature Methods with my colleagues. So basically, with Eric Basic and another colleague called Thomas Planchon. Mm -hmm. uh, he he's a associate professor in Delaware University now, State University. So yeah, so. And at that time, our group just have uh, three people. So all of us worked on project. We indeed pushed the limit of that technique, yeah. and we generated some uh, very cool stuff. I think we initiated that um, research direction of um, of improve the three D imageability of light sheet microscopy by optimizing the light sheet profile. And the technique we use called basal beam plane laser microscopy. And also, I think we were the first group showing how fantastic it is if you can indeed watch the uh, live biological process with high spatial and temporal re resolution. Yeah. And after that, I, mean, I, I think this field become enormously attractive and popular because people realize that, wow, just by spatial resolution improvement, you cannot understand too much. You have to get it alive and you have to do something in order to understand the entire process. Right. That's pretty much what I was doing uh, during my postdoc research with uh, Eric Basic. Yeah. And now take us to when you're doing your system professorship at SUNY Stony Brook. Right. And you're doing tiling twin lattice light sheets. Yeah, uh, more accurately it's called tiling light sheet microscopy, tiling right? Tiling light sheet microscopy. Yeah, so that's a technique I invented when I was uh, assistant professor at the Stony Brook University. The reason my research migrated to that uh, technique is because, um, so indeed we developed some awesome technique, right? 3D light room technique while I was in Eric's basis lab. However, that limit that techniques also technique also had uh, had a lot of limitations. So at the beginning, we we thought we want to develop a light sheet technique that can image uh, large specimens at a high spatial resolution with high image speed, so we can watch the dy dynamics of um, of um, biological specimens. Right, for example, we want to study how embryos developed, we want to study uh, how, 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 what's the uh, neural activities in, uh, in a brain of zebrafish, etc. Uh, so, and then we indeed, we were pretty successful, developed some technique and applied them to cellular specimens. For example, we can image a, a cultured cell on car slip very well. We can image that dynamic process very well. But, uh, it was very difficult to apply the same technique to larger specimens, for example, zebrafish embryos or C. elegans embryos, some, some models that biologists use very often to study biology question, right? So basically, you cannot get the same result on multicellular specimens uh, as you, what you can get on single cellular specimens. And I was confused by why that. And I didn't get that answer when I was doing postdoc in Eric's lab. The other question I was trying to answer was, um, at the beginning, you would be pretty happy when you first seen those dynamic processes, those videos, right? I mean, because it's just quite fantastic to see those live process. But at some point, you would like to understand why, right? Because after seeing what's happening, you all the next question is always why these things are doing those are, are doing that. Why? What? What are they doing? What are those pro molecules are doing? Why the cell migrate from A and B, and what reason cause that result, right? You always want to answer this question, and you will find that even you collect those information, if you don't analyze them properly you won't be able to use this information. You have to interpret the information in a certain way in order to reach a conclusion, right? That's the second question I think we didn't answer during my postdoc research. And then I started to work on these um, issues while I was at Stony Brook. So that's why how I started to work on 
uh, 3D imaging of large multicellular specimens and how I started to work on quantitative, quantitative understanding of uh, cellular behaviors in multicellular environments. The reason that is difficult, let's say the, the difficulty is from several directions. First, you want to study cells in their native environment, right? For example, an embryo. Embryo has a lot of cells, right? It's a very complex environment. It's, it's like a it's, it's, you can consider like a small society, right? Community, right? People are in, 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 interact with each other and people are doing their own stuff, but people are communicating, right? A, a, a behavior of individual cell or individual person is often a result from other people inside your, your own decision, right? It's the same thing happening in a multicellular specimen. And you have to gain that detail, you have to have tools to be able to collect those information in order to understand that, right? That's the first. The second is you have to have a method to understand, to organize the information and reach your conclusion. You have to have a model, you have to have a certain way, let's say an accurate definition of those behaviors. And you have to have a method to, to, to analyze those behaviors, to find the relationship between them. And then that's a difficult or challenge, and none of this exists at that point of time. So that's the, the motivation um, behind my research. And then, of course, the question is how are you going to collect that information, mm -hmm. let's say high spatial and temporal resolution from large specimens, right? And let's say one thing we learned in my postdoc research is one way we use our technique called light sheet microscopy to image a 3D behavior. We want to, a key issue is you, you want to create a large and thin light sheet in order to image a 3D process well, because you have to scan that light sheet across your sample. But after five years of research, we finally realized there's no way you can create a large and thin light sheet at the same, uh, at the same time. Basic means if we proceed along the direction we have been uh, during my postdoc research, we won't be able to achieve this goal. So this looks like a piece of tissue that you're imaging uh -huh. and you're shining laser right. through it in a very thin sheet right, and right. then that's lighting it up enough exactly. for you to image it. Right, so basically imagine you have a tissue, right? I want to see, see it layer by layer, right? What I need to do is I can shine a very thin layer of light to a selective plane of that tissue and I scan that layer across the sample I capture a lot of images and I get a high resolution image of that sample, right? But how you can create that thin layer of light is a is a is an important question. But in the end, we realized no, you cannot create that thin of light over long distance. Mm -hmm. So my technique called tiling light sheet microscopy was, yes, we cannot create a long and thin layer of light, but we can create a we can create a short but thin layer of light. And then what we are doing is we scan, the, move that layer of light quickly within the imaging plane and then by you, you capture multiple images, right? By doing that, you're, it's equivalent to a uh, let's virtual large and thin light sheet. And by using this strategy, you are able to image uh, large multicellular specimens with high resolution. So you're, you're, you're modulating this this laser light from mm. a point to another point to another point exactly and then ca imaging as you modulate it to those different exactly spots. exactly so basically that's another thing let's say the compromise of uh, life basically at the beginning we are looking for something perfect right we want high resolution we want high image speed we want to image things for a very long period of time and uh, with high signal signal to noise ratio but at some point you will realize it's impossible. It's, a, it's just like um, everything, right? It's sometimes very difficult when you ask for everything. But if you can think about exactly what's the most important thing for a specific moment or for some specific experiment, you always find that you can sacrifice something. So in tiny light sheet microscopy, what you are sacrificing, because you have to move light in the field of view, right? Mm -hmm. You sacrifice your, your, your uh, imaging speed a little bit. Yeah. But because the technique is already fast, you can you still can maintain a reasonable speed to to finish that imaging process. And because if you don't do that compromise, you cannot see it. You, there, you, you get nothing. But with this technique, yes, you compromise something, but you gain something at the same time. And another advantage of this technique is that you can you can basically uh, you have very large freedom to decide. I mean. 
how thick that light sheet is, how fast do you want to tell it, so you can have great flexibility to optimize the experiment. And then by doing that, you have more chance to get the information you want from a biological process. And thereafter, you can start to create your model and you can analyze your 3D images and start to understand the relationship between them. That's another reason actually why 3D imaging is important for quantitative analysis. Because if you don't capture the uh, entire process in 3D, if you only capture a certain plan, yes, you can guess, you, you can have a pretty good guess about what's happening. But you will not be able to exactly, let's say, define the exact quantity or let's say, knowing uh, what's going on. Let's say you cannot draw that scientific conclusion in the end. You, have, you only can describe what's happening. Yeah. And let's have you explain also that when you are aiming to use tiling light sheet microscopy to image a mm. piece of tissue, okay. that there are already a tremendous amount of points that you have to modulate yes, the laser exactly. to, to image. So let's talk about the number of points that you think are in like even just something as small as the fruit fly brain. Right, right, right. And then next, after you teach us about how many points there are, teach us about how you then, uh, it's based on uh, how many points there are and how uh, much data is stored is based on yes. the, uh, na the nanometer of right, resolution right, that right. you're capturing that right, out. So teach us right, about that process. Right. So actually your question also relates to my later career decisions. So Let's explain this trajectory then, because this is to Westlake now. Yes, yeah, yes. Okay, so, so I yes. invented this technique uh, at Stony Brook University, right? And it was patented, and actually that patent was granted this year. Um, so after I developed the te technique, it was pretty successful applied to some small specimens, like um, some embryos, etc. But of course, embryos are pretty simple, simple multicellular specimens. You do want to understand them more uh, complicated lives, right? For example, mouse, mouse brain, or just the brain, how they think, how they make decisions, etc. And that, however, there is a big, uh, an, another big uh, problem you have to overcome is, uh, let's say, scattering of the light, or let's say, both the scattering and aberration of light. Let's say, basically, the light cannot penetrate through the tissue, right? It can only penetrate maybe a couple, several hundred microns, and then it's completely scattered. You won't be able to get any high resolution information from them based on the technique we have today. And then I was actually pretty, I was kind of disappointed at that point because I, I thought I developed something quite important. Mm -hmm. However, if you only can apply them to, for example, C. elegans embryos or to the zebrafish at the best, then your technique has a pretty limited impact, right? Because you cannot use it to study more complicated animal models, means, right? And uh, the impact is something we have been looking for. But at that point, maybe in 2016, from a collaboration, I, I learned about a technique called uh, tissue clearing technique. So uh, multiple labs are working on that technique. So basically with that technique, you are able to make tissue transparent. Although they are fixed, so they are dead specimen, but they are transparent, right? If they're transparent, it means you can, you really can start to use light to get the 3D structure of those uh, tissues, which is something very difficult to do, I mean, all, almost impossible to do before this technique was uh, developed. Because before that, what the best people can do is people have to cut the tissue slice by slice. Of course, you can imagine the amount of work you have to do and the limitations on that. So basically, not, not many people are doing that. And then with this tissue clearing technique, you suddenly have the possibility to apply the latest 3D, high-speed 3D, high-resolution imaging technique to gain the structure of the all kinds of tissues, right? For example, the, the, your brain, uh, may not mean not human brain yet, but for example, mouse brain, organs, and you can study tumors, etc. So many different possibilities. And then I say, wow, this must be the future of this technique because it's elim eliminates the barrier of, that prevents this technique to be applied to a larger, field to make more impact, right? And I can see a lot of, let's say, um, commercial potentials of this technique. And then that's why I decided to switch my um, direction 
career direction and, and, and also the research direction at the same time. So I, after that, I joined a technic, uh, company called 3i, right? And I, uh, in that company, I, I use my technique because I have everything in my mind about what instrument I want to build, how I'm going to use my technique, right? And indeed, I studied how to use my uh, tiling lash in my cross piece technique to, to image tissues. And indeed, we I mean basically it's a very natural transit by applying this tiling sheet light sheet microscopy and then uh, apply them on tissue imaging we can image lar large clear tissue for example mouse brain because it's a centimeter size level right it's it's a, a very large size actually um, in, in aspect to imaging mm -hmm. uh, with very high resolution however also the spatial resolution was great I realized several problems the first problem is um, is uh, the time you have to spend in order to uh, get that information. Because the sample is so large, and meanwhile you want high resolution, mm -hmm. right? If you do a calculation, you will find it's going to take hours, even days, in order to get a cellular level resolution of a few micron. And because of uh, we are using a tiling process, tiling process is something, as I said, I mean, you sacrifice the time to gain the resolution, right? Yeah. But at some point, that time, that price becomes too high. <laughs> yeah. For example, if you, let's say, for a small specimen, if it used to take one minute, now you spend, you spend five minutes, it's okay because four minutes more, right? But if it used to spend one hour, now you spend it to five hours, then that's a significant deal because four hours is a lot of time you don't want to spend, right? And then that's one issue I start to think about how to, um, how to overcome. And the next thing is, of course, about the, the, the data size. Again, because of the sample is so large and you want to get a high resolution, typical size of data you have to collect and analyze this at least at hundreds of gigabytes level and very easily goes to terabytes or PB level, privacy level. And then that's, uh, let's say that's, these are the still uh, frontier problems that uh, unsolved and people are trying to solve and we are trying to solve. And actually, fortunately, we, that this is something about our latest research. Actually, about uh, how you're overcoming these exactly. challenges. Exactly. Okay. If you imagine the process of tiling a light sheet, imagine this is a field view, right? I have a light sheet, I want to tile it one, two, three, four times in order to get the entire plane image, right? It takes four times long, uh, uh, longer time to image the plane. However, also, despite my resolution, is higher. Mm -hmm. But is there anything we how can we accelerate this process? Our latest technique called discontinuous light sheet. So basically, instead of using one light sheet, we are using a, 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 a group of light sheet. For example, let's say each of my finger represents a light sheet, right? So if you want to, if you only have one finger, you want to put them in time positions. Mm -hmm. But now you have five, you only need to move them once and you can get everything down. Mm -hmm. So that's our, and by doing that, you, your speed can be improved dramatically, right? And you don't lose that resolution anymore. You still keep that resolution. And this is actually our latest result. We were pretty excited about it. And we get it submitted yesterday. <laughs> mm, wow. wow so, but this idea was in my mind for a long yeah. time while, yes. I was, um, while I was in 3i. Um, but because of the, the, let's say the decisions in a company is always, it's, it, it's decided, it's d determined by profit, right? There's nothing wrong with it. So in a company, you have to make a profit to survive. But how to make profit and how the decision about, let's say there is short-term profit and there is long-term profit. And meanwhile, I mean, for any company, you will need to decide what's the ending point of the company. Some company will be satisfied with, let's say, stay with 20, 30 people and survive as, as long as possible. And then people will be happy with that kind of business. But at some point, I mean, in my idea, because think about at the beginning why I decided to do this. Tissue imaging was a blank area. Nobody was able to do it easily before. Now, suddenly, we have so many, let's say, good technique can do gain tissue structures um, with high resolution and we can we can get immediately get so much abundant information about our body right about all kinds of different tissues that information is a fortune i think it can lead us to a complete understanding in in, in bioscience and in, in uh, related to the 
our, our health and for clinical applications, disease di diagnostic, etc. Because it's tissue, right? And then that means you can correlate, you can connect this to billion dollar, even trillion dollar business. And that is the impact I think all the future I'm looking for. I'm not sure whether it's going to happen or not, but I think I mean, there will be enough smart people see this kind of future and will be working on it. And to me, because I think I understand this technique and I understand the direction, I would like to be involved in this process and I would like to develop the key technique with it. And meanwhile, I believe there will be other people working on different sets of problems to make the entire protocol executable on humans or on large areas. And in the end, if we combine our solution together, we can, we can make something, we can, we, we can um, basically change things dramatically, right? We can, we can, we can make some uh, pretty uh, dramatic um, influence yes. or, or change. Yes. So then is it then taking multiple lasers uh -huh. at locations? Oh that are just far enough away from each other where you don't experience the issues with diffraction and... Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question actually. That's a key question. Indeed, you have to s separate them far enough. You can, they cannot be too close to avoid, uh, in order to avoid the interference be uh, between them. And we do have a, basically we use a, a, a device called a spatial light modulator and we have some develop some good method to operate that device to generate the light sheet, the discontinuous light sheet we want. So it can behave in, uh, in ways that we would like it to behave. Actually, there are some more ideas we will apply to this tech, actually, which I won't tell you here, but actually we can further improve the speed and resolution of this technique. Because even with this development, if you think about it to get high resolution result from mouse brain. So our goal is to get, to image the entire mouse brain with less than 100 nanometer spatial resolution. Mm -hmm. Even with this improvement, it's going to take years to have the entire sample image. It's not fast enough. Uh -huh. We want to keep the resolution, but we need the throughput to be higher. And then- and you guys have ideas to make exactly, that Exactly, which is uh, what okay. we are working on in order to make this thing happen. Be why that is important? Because after you gain that ability, you will be able to understand all, let's say the goal is to understand how mind is generated in our brain, right? How decisions are generated. And you have to understand that neural circuit in order to gain this information. It has to be fast enough to, under, because there are all, all kinds of different behaviors, right? So you have to make the throughput high enough to be able to image, study all different types of behaviors and again extract that information from the from the uh, nature right from a mouse from other kind of multi animals maybe fish right at some point maybe from ourselves so that's why this kind of ability is so important and we are going to put all of our resource in order to achieve this goal so that's uh, something what we are working on and we think we have ideas about how to make it happen. There are risks, but uh, the West Lake is, uh, is uh, one of the best place to, that they gave us the resource, they, 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 they support us 100% to let us do what we want and make things happen. That's why one reason actually I decided to join this university because um, again, what we have discussed, you need the freedom, you need the support, uh, you need the resource to to make it happen. The, the part left to us is work hard. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Westlake is a place of great magic, of yes. interdisciplinary magic. It's, yes. it's beautiful. And now you have two research assistants, three PhDs right now. You guys are pushing the edge further and further in the field, the frontier further and further. This uh, discontinuous light sheet microscopy right, right. is a very interesting um, addition to tiling. It's really interesting. Um, it's taking uh, right now our imaging at as low as a hundred nanometer yes. resolution. But and we were talking about this before we started in your lab. Right. That this is still not doing the molecular side of things, the 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 the, um, the neurochemical right. um, side of things, in like something like the brain. Right. And right, so right. the imaging is is 
Excellent, and that's going to have to be overlaid eventually also with the neurochemical, exactly. molecular side of things as well, and that will give us the full picture. Exactly, of, yeah. exactly. So we are doing our job. So I think this is a common goal of many research labs, for many, a lot of top research labs in in United States, in Japan, generally, uh, Harvard, MIT, I mean, a lot, Tokyo University, a lot of, in, in Europe, a lot of groups are having this common goal and trying to uh, achieve this goal, right? The, indeed, labeling is a very important issue. We are trying to work on these problems. I believe many other people are working on this problem as well. So we are willing to see what solution, because I believe is there are so many people that are smarter than us. They are going to give us new insights, new solutions at the same time. We are doing our best, and in the meanwhile, we are collecting all the best method product. For example, a method called expansion microscopy. We are also trying to use that. So with all this, everybody work together. I mean, as uh, again, come to our very first your your very first question, right? We all contribute the best part of uh, of our efforts, and by combining combining our solutions, we may have this problem uh, solved. Which is uh, yeah, we we are excited to be a, a part of yeah. this um, yeah. this community, yeah. Yeah. and we are honored to be able to contribute. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It, it was so cool being able to go to the different labs and basically learn how as you push a frontier, someone else can take what you're doing and implement it in their lab. Exactly. And exactly. you guys are just a couple hundred meters away from each other. It's, exactly. And that's how you can create this 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 community of frontier pushing faster right yeah right, and, right. and that's such a beautiful part yeah, of these yeah. yeah yeah i believe because i have been following uh research works of many good labs i think there are people following me and uh yeah actually it's a small it seems to be a big word but in this days it's so small uh yeah so to me i mean i i don't feel i'm at a different location of the world, I mean, uh, my feeling is I'm still in this uh, society uh, that connect with uh, each other. So, and let's also ex um, explain how um, you for uh, the for the technology that was made with the tiling light sheet mm. microscopy. It's available for non-commercial yes. use. Yes, this is a very important. So scientists from around the world can ask you for permission yes, to exactly. use the design, the software, the Everything. execution, the whole process. Right, right, right. Yes. I, I think this is our um, responsibility, obligation to contribute to the society about what we know, what we learn. Because let's say first, from my own aspect, we are developing tools and methods, right? I mean, in order to make, let's say, 90% or 95% of methods dying in nowhere. Nobody knows the existence of them, nobody remembers them, they just disappear. For a scientist who, are, who is developing a um, method, you don't want that to happen, right? You definitely want your technique to contribute positively to scientific research, right? To make that impact. So that's one reason I feel I, I want to push my technique to uh, more research labs. I have that belief that uh, uh, we are doing the best imaging technique, and I, I I want to want people to take the benefit of uh, our um, research. So myself, we, we gain satisfaction from this process, right? The second is we are obligated to to do this because again, Westlake University is uh, funded by private donors, and some tax dollars as, as well. I mean, this, in my opinion, this is a long-term investment of the society to scientific research. Because what's the fundamental reason that people are doing research? It's curiosity. It's, it's, there is not much say, I, let's say very few good researchers are funded or let's say produced because we know what the, what's the return, right? A lot of them just develop, I mean, or establish based on our curiosity. But we all know that our curiosity in a long term, um, uh, in a long run, going to return our society, going to have a return that is unpredictable, right? That is kind of uh, uh, investment. That is, uh, let's say, the contract we are holding with the entire society. So for that reason, indeed, our technique is 
be be distributed through two ways, right? Commercially and uh, uh, non-commercial distribution. Commercially, we do have new technique patented and licensed to companies to to make it happen. Because for some people, even they have everything, they, they won't build an instrument. It's out of their focus, it's out of their ability, and they don't have time to spend all that. They, they, they'd rather to, to buy instead of spend their time uh, to, to build. Because time is money, right? Time is for, for a lot of people, more valuable than money. But for other labs, for many other labs, they may use it for different purposes. That's why we are giving our uh, entire um, design, software, everything to research labs for non-commercial use. We are happy, very happy actually, we are honored to, uh, to do that. Uh, actually, this is also something I learned from my uh, postdoc advisor, uh, Eric Bezik in uh, Genelia. He's doing that. I mean, I'm happy to inherit that tradition and to um, basically to, to ret return our knowledge to the society, not only to, to China, I mean to, to everyone uh, in the world. I, I think, uh, yes, that, that's, that's our belief. Um, I love that part about your vision. It's so important to communicate that around the world. As we push the frontier of science, we can open up our technology and tools that we've pushed the frontier with to enable thousands of other people from around the world to use those to keep pushing the frontier to advance it faster and to democratize the benefits across the world to all people. Right. Let's talk about the democratized benefits as well. Um, you told me that um, it would be so cool to see this technology uh, be able to be used and approved for healthcare purposes around right. the world. Right. How cool would it be to be able to see <laughs> my tissues, my biometrics, right. or even our family members, because most often it's our parents or our grandparents right, that have right, right. serious health issues, yeah. and then we say, scientists, doctors, <laughs> please save my family. And so the idea is that maybe when you have some sort of an issue going on with your body, with your yeah, family's yeah, bodies, yeah, yeah. you can use great technologies like yours at the hospitals um, once they are FDA approved to be able to mm -hmm. take an image, those parts of our, of our health, and then be able to do things like run artificial intelligence calculations to identify patterns, predict pathologies right, right, from developing, right, all different types right. of stuff. Tell us about this big picture vision for, uh, for augmenting our health. So this is, uh, let's say first of all, this is kind more or less like a gut feeling, right? So why, why I think this, going to, this kind of ability, let's say collect um, high resolution tissue inform information from human body going to mean something if significant because we don't know our body very well. I mean, with the, this kind of knowledge about cellular structure, even cellular, subcellular structure of different human tissues of our body, we are going to learn a lot of things about our health condition, about um, genetic uh, f functions, about why we are uh, we behave differently, etc. We don't know, right? Because we never had that information. But from our experiences, it's always like when you do have more information, uh, you have the chance to understand more about yourself, about let's say about life. So that's a belief uh, in my mind. So I, I'd rather to take that risk. I mean, of course, I'm trying to sell in this concept at the same time. And of course, at this point, we do have the chance to do it now because of tissue clearing, because of the high resolution 3D imaging. Of course, there are several problems you want to overcome at the same time, right? People will say, well, I mean, why people would like you to cut their tissue to do this kind of analysis? How hard going to label them, right? I mean, Actually, there are people working on these problems already. I mean, I cannot tell you exact, for example, at least we know we can cut your skin, right? I mean, people, if you can, skin cancer is, is, is one of the most dangerous cancer among the world, right? Especially in the US. I mean, if, I don't think people would mind if you cut a small piece of skin and be able to know his chance to, to, to get skin cancer, mm -hmm. etc. right? I mean, with ability, we can do that. For example, when people are doing surgery, I mean, people won't mind if you cut small tissue. I mean, it won't hurt them, mm -hmm. right? 
And then there are a lot of ways to do that. And I believe people are going to develop better protocols by those doctors or biologists. I believe there are enough smart people to have this, have this problem solved. And then what we can offer, what we can offer is we can image that, that piece of tissue in minutes uh, with the resolution that actually we can do that right now. And we are, our technique is pretty uh, unique actually in, in the, uh, in the way of application, it's, it uh, has a very strong self alignment ability. So basically, that instrument makes sure it works by itself. And then, why that's, this is important? Because people who are going to operate the instrument are going to be doctors, going to be people who never be trained to do scientific research. And we think this is very important for this technique to be to be um, used in hospitals, in clinics uh, uh, as well, right? And then how are you going to use that? In, I mean, uh, let's say, after you gain this analysis ability, how are you going to execute this analysis ability? I mean, we are trying to create a network like social media. I mean, our big plan I mean, is, is, is something, it's, it's a pie in the sky right now, but that's some, definitely something I'm trying to convince some people to do is, I mean, when we have that ability matured, we are trying to push it, let's say we are giving this technique, we are giving this instrument f to hospitals, to clinics uh, free, I mean, and then we are, we give them standard protocols so everybody can use the same protocol to collect the information and we are trying to build a cloud system based on all this instrument. Imagine if you have a thousand, I mean there are maybe 20, 30 thousand hospitals, perhaps more, my number may not be accurate, in, in China or maybe there are more hospitals uh, worldwide, right? If, if all this hospital has one or couple of this equipment and they work I mean, routinely, high efficiently, I mean, in minutes level to collect this kind of issue, uh, this kind of information from different tissue, from different diseased tissue, etc., different organs, etc., we will have huge, val very valuable um, database about ourselves, about human, and then I believe we are going to get something very important information out of this database. Yes. I mean, that's our big goal. I think I, I think this this is this going to be the f fortune. This is going to be the future uh, of this technique, uh, the application of this technique at the human health level, at uh, disease diagnostic level, etc. People may have even better ideas at yes. that point in time. Of course, when we are talking about collect the tissue, let's say structure information from from human beings. It's going to have a lot of other issues, for example, the privacy, right? Um, and, and how this kind of uh, application can be regulated well and how the information can be used wisely, etc. Yes. I mean, um, this is another thing that's going to require better understanding, communication, and, uh, and um, regulation. Uh, between different labs, different countries, and uh, and the scientists, right? So that's something. I mean, it it, it it is highly important. It's exciting, and it requires collaboration, requires vision, uh, requires passion, and that's something we like to do. Yeah, <laughs> open up the big data silos around the world and help make the pattern, patterns be able to be recognized better, have the constant stream of biometrics from our health be able to be analyzed to predict pathologies. I wanted to see if maybe there was a way, like you're with your mass spectrometry, taking it down from 100 kilograms to five kilograms, if maybe there was a way to do it with tiling light sheet microscopy, yes. where instead of having to do it in the hospitals, I could basically maybe wear something around me with me all the time that would do exactly. a dynamic capture exactly. in the dimension of time. Exactly. First of all, let's say we, we indeed we are working. Our instrument is not expensive. Um, let's say for some basic models, the raw cost day is about a um, hundred thousand dollars. That's a, it's not a small amount of money, but compared to most scientific instruments, it's a cheap device and it has a lot of function. Secondly, we indeed have solutions to make it even cheaper. So we indeed can give it out for free, right? That's a very important thing. But the last, the most important thing is uh, if it's indeed I mean, so valuable, 
I mean, nobody really care about the price. I don't think price is the first concern when people decide to do something, right? For those big companies, private companies, they want, when they decide to put billion dollars of in investment on something, for example, Facebook, Google, or Apple, when they decide to invest on something, I don't think the, the profit is a big factor, but profit is not, perhaps not the most important factor. I think the impact, impact. Is, a, is the most important factor. Because, let's say, money at some point is very important. But after some point, money is not an important issue at all for, 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 many, um, for many people, for many companies or, or countries. Because money at some point, it's, it's, it's paper, right? It's printed paper. Money is printed based on our confidence, on our economy, on our behavior. And that's our behavior is actually the basis of economy, right? If Once we, are, we meet a certain amount of basic needs exactly. that are met, we want to start spreading impact. Exactly. So, uh, so I, 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 at that point, I mean, if we indeed can prove this is something extremely important, uh, valuable, I, I, I don't think we will be lack of support uh, or money to do it. So, in yeah, after all, we have to prove this is a, this is a good way to go. This is something we can spend spend our time and efforts in yeah 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 <laughs> how about uh, on the way out let's ask some questions how can we inspire more people to collaborate together around our world yeah uh, <laughs> that's a that's a good uh, question everybody should ask themselves i should ask myself me because sometimes people are mad at things for no reason right you're mad at um, other people, you're mad at your family members, you're mad at yourself at some point. So, let's say, yeah, let's go back to our first discussion, first question again about, we talked about the regulation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, perhaps we, we all have to think about what's the most important thing in our life, what we are looking for, uh, what's important. Because the reason to make that question clear is because after you know what's the exact thing you want, what's important to you, you can get rid of the disturbance easier. So you won't be disturbed by many trivial things anymore. And when you are not disturbed by those unimportant trivial things, when uh, you are very focused on your goal, I think you have better control on your temper, you have better understanding on people and you have better motivation to to work positively or constructively with people from different background or mind. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important thing about how we can uh, collaborate or work together better. I guess in order to make that happen, you have to understand yourself better, right? You have to understand what's important to you, what you, are, what you want and what you can compromise in this kind of uh, uh, collaboration, right? That's uh, perhaps the uh, most uh, critical part. And of course, in this process, that's some other education concept that we're trying to, let's say, um, embed uh, into our school is we have to learn that when we work constructively, uh, there, there is a win-win situation, right? So basically, one plus one could be larger than one. We can if we indeed work together with good understanding, we can, we can make things happen uh, tremendously faster and nicer, right? Grow the pie for everyone. E e exactly, which is a ver the very important thing. The second important thing is, if you have the belief of a winning situation, then negotiation, how to negotiate, how to resolve disagreement is another important skill we all have to learn, right? So basically, you, you, ha you have to understand yourself better, understand your partner better, and to have the disagreement solved in a way that everybody maybe have to compromise something, but you also gain what you want is through that collaboration. So basically, understand yourself, try to understand others, and have a good belief, let's say a common belief of win-win situation, I think is the basis of, um, of the interaction between different people and between different countries worldwide, I think. Um, yeah, I think indeed in, 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 this, um, uh, in the world today, I think this is, this is very co important concept that everybody should learn 
should um, yeah include ourselves. I guess we should. Yeah, 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 yes. yeah. Likewise, yeah. That's really great. How about what do you think is the meaning of life? This big human experiment. Right. <laughs> so yeah, this is a this is a good question because at different period of time maybe. We have a different answer to that question, right? But at this specific moment, I think I I was um, let's say when I was a student, I trying to get into a good college. I think perhaps that's a good meaning of my life. And then when I was in college, I was trying to find a good job. And when I was I got my PhD, or I trying to get a good payment, a good salary, perhaps that's very important to my life. But at some point, I mean, none of those um, let's say none of those are um, the pursuit of those goals going to make going to last very long or going to make you happy. Uh, at some point, I, I realized perhaps I have been my my career is a little bit complicated. I did a lot of different things. I think in the end, I I I has been I I have been looking for a better myself. I have been trying to reach a better performance. Actually, there are a uh, couple movies that um, I, I I like, and I like their concept about let let's say looking for a better performance, looking for a better version of yourself. Because we have a limited life. I want to see what's the if if I. Train myself. If I did in a way that I think I regulate in a way that I think I'm going to achieve the best, yes. I want to see what's the best I can achieve at that point, right? So there was a good movie about this it. called The Free Solo. I perhaps you watch it, right? That that guy trying to climb yeah. over uh, cliffs, I mean, without any protection. He seems to be a crazy guy, but I think I I can understand him because he said some people look for happiness in his life, and some people work for look for performance, right? Yeah, I think I'm one of them looking for uh, one of the guys looking for performance. That's uh, that's uh, I think motivation can last longer and make me um, excited. And another movie actually uh, maybe it's extend the topic go too far. Um, it's it's called Gladiator. Uh -huh. So gladiators, if you, at some point people will think gladiators are slaves, right? They they fight to death. It's pretty sad life. But you but if you Think about look look at the history. If you think about them, I mean, at some point they 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 don't feel sad. I mean, they they are pretty. They they are they are dying in a glory, right? So at some point, if you think about the meaning of life, everybody is going to die at some point, right? You I mean you you don't know what is going to happen to to your life. You don't know when it's going to be the end of your. Of 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 your life, right? And then when those gladiator uh, uh, fight, gladiator fights, what's in their mind? They are thinking about the death of glory, right? Mm -hmm. So what they are saying is, "Hail Caesar!" People about to die salute you,、mm -hmm. right? I think at some point we are all gladiators at the point. So we salute to our lives, right? We want that glory in the end. So that's the meaning of life. Yes,、yeah, awesome, beautifully said. Okay, and then what do you think consciousness is? You mean how that happens? Yeah, yeah, that's a question. Actually, we are trying to understand, right? That's why we are doing all this kind of. Yeah, this is very interesting because if you think about what's the difference of, um, uh, yes. So if you think about. Ourselves, what are we? We are a group of molecules, right? We are a molecule assembly. That's all, right? That's all. But but at some point, these molecules have mind, has conscious, as you as you said, we are trying to do crazy things and、um, <laughs> and trying to understand ourselves, right? That's indeed a very interesting thing. So basically, again, as we discuss a little bit, as so. It includes two parts, right? It includes a execution about the chemical reactions, about the, how the signal is tra、uh, transferred by electron or by ions, etc. Electrical signals, and it includes another part of、uh, which is the algorithm that the the logic that dominates this execution,、uh, execu uh, execution, right? And then this part, basically, the logic. And the execution of the logic form our mind, form, form and, and direct our behavior, right? And then, where this is this come from, and whether we can understand it in the end, I I, I think I I have no answer. I don't I don't know. Although we are trying to understand it,、mm -hmm. um, but indeed this can can drive I mean. 
can drive it can drive our behavior for, for a very long time and can drive our research motivation for a long time. But in the end, if at some point we indeed understand how it's formed, how it's created, and uh, might be I will li be a little bit upset at the point, I think. Mm -hmm. Because then what else you can do? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there's, there's plenty more to push the frontier even right, after right. that. Yeah. Right, right. But do you think that we are in a simulation? Yeah, and you mean about metrics, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but what's the difference? It doesn't make a difference, right? That's a, that's a, that's a, let's say, is that a serious answer? Uh, I've not, I, actually, I like that movie. I, I indeed like the, that uh, aspect of uh, perspective of uh, rethinking our life. But we, we cannot, I, I think we, we perhaps cannot rule out the possibility, right? Because our understanding is so limited. I mean, if, yeah, I mean, we think we know a lot of things at this point, but if you, I mean, we, we are, I think maybe human beings are always at this kind of exaggerated uh, status. We, we think we know a lot. We actually, we don't know much. <laughs> and we become uh, arrogant at some point, but perhaps we are uh, right. It, yeah, if you indeed, even by the, um, even for the question you, you just answered, right, how much we know about ourselves, not much, right? We really don't know. I mean, maybe it's just the start of a, of a long journey, and we don't know if, um, how long this journey going to be able to be last, right? Because meanwhile, people are doing crazy things. I mean, there are people doing positive things, there are negative things happening. Eventually, it's quite a chaotic <laughs> society on the other hand. So yeah, maybe that's why life is uh, interesting, right? But um, yeah, it's not why people, yeah. some people start to think positively, people, some people start to think negatively or destruct, destructively, destructively. I mean, um, yeah, all these are good questions worth of uh, study. I mean, yeah, in the end, the research, I guess that's why I think research is not about, it's not about science, it's not about technology, it's really about the curiosity. Um, Understanding our reality. E exactly. It's, I, I think that's a fundamental reason of, uh, of um, science is based on our curiosity. Of course, I, I think for us, it's a it's a luxury. I mean, it's a um, it's an, it, 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 it's a yeah. In, in, indeed, I mean, we, we it, it's our um, how to say that. Um, um, so we had this opportunity, uh, the given opportunity to have a good environment to be able to answer these questions, we have the resource to be spent to, to do experiment we, want, uh, we are um, asking. And I think this is extremely um, precious um, um, opportunities that we should um, really use these resources uh, well to, yeah, to, to give a good answer on them, yes. And then what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Most beautiful thing? Yeah. Yeah, so many. What are they? I mean, perhaps life, right? Perhaps life. It, it, at some point, if you ask me uh, what's a beautiful thing, my, it, what's reflecting my mind immediately uh, uh, are my children's. Uh, yes, so you, you see how they develop from <laughs> nothing yeah. and to a life, to a human that has a lot of uh, uh, thinkings have their own will. I mean, I, I think this 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 is this it's this process is uh, so uh, so beautiful. Yes, yeah. yeah perhaps our life is a beautiful, most beautiful thing of this world. I think, and yeah, indeed, right. That's we are what we are doing, right. I mean, in in, in indeed, there's no more a uh, more complicated thing than than, than ourselves. And uh, I mean, exactly. Um, it's, uh, it's magic. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, thinking about our, our children as just this uh, cell that is um, goes and becomes a living, breathing, thinking exactly. human being that exactly. has meaning in life. Right, and, yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> becomes a part of civilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You still yeah. remember the days they are baby, and now at some point they can argue with you. They yeah. have, <laughs> 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 and they, 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 can, they can tell jokes with you, and they can... So, yeah, I mean, and they have different personality, and actually, yeah, very, yeah, I mean, that's that's awesome, that's amazing. For yeah, my boys, me, my elder son, especially me, is is such a me interesting person. I mean, I I just enjoy the conversation with him a lot of times. I mean, yeah, so I yes, indeed, this is such a beautiful thing. Yes, yes. <laughs> And thank you so much for thank you so much for having me. Yes, yes nice really conversation. Huge pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for all your incredible work. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about tiling light sheet microscopy, about these new optical methods that enable rapid high resolution 3D imaging of expanded biological specimens. And also check out the links in the bio below to Westlake University. Check out the links in the bio below to Langau's work as well. Check that out. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support them and help them grow. You can find our links in the bio below as well. You can help support us so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site to incredible places like Westlake University and conducting interviews with some of the most brilliant minds. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. And we will see you soon. Thank you. Peace. <laughs> Good. That was so good. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.